Welcome to AccuWeather's Ask the Experts. I'm your host, Jeff Cornish. Here we go beyond the forecast to give you the how and why on all the cool and interesting things you've wondered about and wanted to ask about in the fields of weather, space, and science. And the weather impacts all of us in so many ways. Today, we're going to cover the weather's impact on athletes, from amateur to professional and in between, as they train for everything from a weekend run to the most elite aspects of endurance sports, including Ironmans, and ultra marathons. And joining us today to discuss this is AccuWeather's own Ironman expert, senior meteorologist, and a big part of our long range team, uh, AccuWeather's Joe Lundberg. And uh, Joe, many people call you the crystal ball. Uh, for I good think we reason. can thank Bernie for that. <laughs> I think yeah. so. And, uh, you know, this is because of uh, your knack for long range forecasting. Uh, sometimes when I'm home in the morning, I love watching you and Bernie together. Uh, on the AccuWeather Network is you're always so insightful and uh, you're, you nail it. Well, it's time, about time putting again. the pieces together of the pattern and then, okay, what is going to result from that pattern? What, what shakes out of it? And what are the three things that you want to know most about that going forward? That's great. And uh, people may not fully realize that most meteorologists focus on the, the three to seven day forecast or something like that. So it is a different animal and there are some it tough is. challenges tied to that. Yeah. Uh, so, Joe, how did you get into the weather in the first place? Uh, it started back in third grade. I was paired up with this kid who had his desk adjoining mine. He already had the weather as a passion, so I ended up becoming interested in the weather as well. And one of the things we did, we had these um, uh, a wooden puzzle of the United States, had the had shapes of the United States in it. We'd dump it out, put it all together. So I learned geography back then. We'd take tracing paper, trace out an outline of the United States, and then draw weather maps on it. That was my introduction to weather. All right, back That's in third stuff. grade. That's pretty impressive. Yep. And um, I know that uh, you know you're, you're great with long range forecasting. But there's another passion in your life, and you've shared some of this uh, with me. That uh, you're really into endurance sports. You're out on the bike a ton. And mm -hmm. tell us how you got into uh, the world of endurance sports. And, and part of this was part of your story a couple decades ago. Yeah, it, it, it started back basically in the early 2000s. I had a health scare in uh, 2004. It it was a kidney infection, which is not necessarily a really big thing, and I got some antibiotics, and it was just gone in a couple of days. But I remember the specifics of the you know the numbers: 142 over 80 it was my blood pressure, which is you know pre-hypertension, and my weight was 271, and those numbers scared me. And I said, something's not going to go well if I don't change things. But I had no idea what to do. But it was that that really began the series of events uh, that led me into endurance sports. And uh, I'm sure that uh, you didn't uh, just ramp right up to where you are now. So how did that uh, process look? I, I discovered a bicycle shop nearby and I bought a hybrid bike from it with the big wide tires. I said, I'm too big to be able to ride those skinny, skinny <laughs> tires at the time. So I bought that and I rode a little bit with a friend that summer. That wasn't much. Um, and then I got together with a group in the summer of 2005 and we started doing like 25, 30, 35 mile rides. And I said, this is kind of fun. And there was a woman that was in part of that group that said, I want to do a thousand miles, my goal from Memorial Day to Labor Day. And it sparked an idea. Wow. I wonder if I could do 2,000 miles over the course of the year. So I set that goal for 2006, and the rest, of they say, is history. All right. Just for perspective, uh, I think of, you know, 2,000 is a good annual number because that's the, the number. If you work a 40-hour work week, 50 weeks of the year, you work about 2,000 hours okay. in, in a year. So it's just kind of a, you know, it's about an eight-hour uh, day. Um, it just kind of helps me uh, to kind of pace it out there. I like that. that actually I hadn't thought like. of it that way before. Yeah, it's kind of a numbers thing. I don't mm -hmm. know. Uh, well, that's really good stuff. And at this point now, you're doing ultra. Well, you're you're doing uh, Ironmans, and mm -hmm. um, what does the training look like at this point in your life? Uh, it's a lot more involved, but I have a schedule. I'm usually done by midday so that the afternoons are free. And in the summertime, you obviously have a lot more di daylight. So I'll use that time to go out and ride my bike for two, three, four hours, whatever, you know, however the spirit moves me. I'll mix in the running and the swimming that you would do for Ironmans. But my passion is cycling. I mean, that's, that's the thing that I do the most of. And uh, whether you're a weekend warrior or maybe a smidge under that, like myself, or somebody who is uh, more of a, a highly tuned athlete, uh, we're closer to, to yourself here. Uh, <laughs> What, uh, you know, the weather impacts all this, and, and there's some seasonality to this, too, especially yes, if you're in the, the mid-latitudes here, where most of us, at least north of I-20 or north of I-30, happen to live. Um, so what does winter, it can take us through the seasons, winter, spring, summer, and fall. 
What are some of the challenges and benefits of each season? Well, obviously, in the wintertime, you've got to worry about cold. You know, that, that affects, you know, how you dress for it. So you have to wear layers. You have to make sure you protect your extremities if you're going to be out exercising. And if, for running, it's not as hard, necessarily, as it is for, for, for biking. You know, for when I'm out trying to ride my bike, if it's like 32, 33 degrees, Usually I'm going to curtail my activities to maybe an hour, hour and a half, two hours at most, just simply because my extremities tend to get cold. Um, you have to face the wind or obviously snow and, and uh, sleet, ice and stuff like that. And if the weather's that kind of bad, I'm going to do work out inside. Absolutely. There's no way I'm going to go outside. Yeah, it's dangerous. It is. And then as we step into uh, spring and fall, the bumper seasons, they seem, at least from the armchair casual observer on the side, uh, like myself, Seems like the easiest time to do this, easiest, right? Easiest, but you have to you have to learn the art of layering. And I say it's an art because it's different for everybody. You may start your workout. If, I, if I'm going to go for an, a two-hour bike ride, I may start with one temperature, but it may be 10 degrees different when I finish. So I've got to figure out, okay, what is the layer of clothes that is going to best suit me for that? Or is it something that it's going to change so much I need to wear layers that I can peel off and stuff like in my back pocket or something like that? So there's an art to it. That makes good sense. And um, we see a lot of day-to-day -day variability. Uh, I often say to people that uh, in October or April, it's kind of rare to actually be average. We're just as likely to be 5 or 10 degrees above yes. average or 5 to 10 below average during this mm -hmm. time. So I'm sure that the day-to-day -day variation uh, varies quite a bit, too. Yeah, I mean, you get to this time of the year in the summer season where the weather's more consistent, you know, you can pretty much have the same kind of gear on a day-to-day -day basis. But you're right, in the transition season, summer and fall, you know, that variability, you know, it may be 70 degrees one day, the next day it's 40. You know, so you have to take that into account. And technology changes so fast, too. It's not just computer-driven oh stuff. Oh, my gosh, yes. are, are you buying different gear now compared to 15 years ago? Not all that much. Okay. In fact, I have stuff that I'm still using from 15 years ago, strangely enough. I'm, I'm kind of a cheapskate that way. And I don't have the latest gadget to tell me what my power meter is and stuff like that. <laughs> and I, I just want to go out to have fun. I don't want another job. I have a job, and I like what I do. I want my passion outside of work to still be fun and a hobby. All right. And sometimes uh, when you're heading out the door and I'm just getting in, uh, I'll uh, ask you if you're heading out. And the answer is almost always yes. Almost always yes. Even if it's not a, a 10 I've got start. a change of gear after we're done today, and I'm, that's what I'm going to go do. Well, we appreciate that you're sticking around a little late today. You're welcome. You're welcome. <laughs> right. uh, what are some of the harshest conditions that you have uh, done this in? You know, I would say heat um, would be one of the biggest ones. There was an event that I did a number of years ago called Total 200. Uh, it was based out of Washington, D.C. And if you're familiar with the Washington, D.C. climate in late June, it's typically hot. And the year that I'm thinking of was June, late June of 2012. And you being a weather buff, you might remember that was the year of the duration. Oh, that was a very memorable year. The day before the event, it was 104 with dew points in the mid-70s. The day of, it cooled off. It was only in the mid-90s. But I was trying to do 200 miles that day. I only got to 144 before I cramped up. But that's some of the harshest conditions that I've been in. I've, been, I've cycled in 40 mile per hour winds before. I have cycled in some snow. Yes, I have. But nothing that has laid on the road very much. Okay. Very interesting. Well, we do have our first viewer question. This one comes from Julie in Washington, D.C. Okay. Julie writes, uh, I've always thought about entering a 5K race. Any advice on the best way to start training and keeping the motivation up to continue training? First thing I would consult with your physician, your healthcare physician, to find out you know if that's an okay exercise to do. And assuming that that it is, then you start easy. It might even be something where you walk you know down the block and back, and then you mix in a little jog or something like that. So you start with bite-sized morsels, and you increase it in small increments. When I first started running, that's what I did. My first run, when I got serious about it, was six tenths of a mile. It's all I did. Down the block and back. That's then great. a couple of days later, I did eight tenths of a mile. Then I started to work it up, and then you just add little increments. Also, tell somebody you want to enter that 5K so that you're accountable to somebody. Find a running partner that will encourage you, somebody that will be there no matter how slow or fast you are that say, you know, I've got your back. I'll, I'll, go, I'll go there with you. That's great. Accountability goes a long way in yes, many aspects of life there, and, and uh, physical fitness is, is no uh, exception. Uh, many of you may know that the uh, State College area is home to the AccuWeather headquarters, and uh, recently, in 2023, State College had a big local event uh, mm -hmm. as uh, we had our first uh, State College Ironman competition, which was a big success. Thousands of people participated. Mm -hmm. uh, tell us about your experience with that. Well, it was fun to be a part of the committee that brought it to State College. You know, I had a hand in designing the, the, the bike course, which some people were not happy with me afterwards because <laughs> of some of the climbs that were on it. But I know it was fun to be a part of that committee and watch the whole process. And then during the day of the event, 
it was very humid. So it was one of those things, okay, in my mind, I'm, I know that my performance is going to suffer a little bit as a result of that. And you have to make sure you stay on top of hydration and electrolytes and things of that nature. So I was conscious of that. So when I got to the run portion of the event, I just walked some of the aid stations and took it a little easier. It meant a slower finishing time, but it meant I got to finish on my own power without any cramps. So that was one of the keys to, to that uh, first event in 2023. Fantastic. And I know uh, there uh, are other events uh, very similar to that in the State College that you're going to be participating yes, in as well. Absolutely. Good stuff. Well, Joe, this is great information so far. Uh, we were going to talk a lot more about this in just a little bit. So uh, we also want to mention that coming up in WeatherWise, we're going to look at the meaning behind some of those popular weird weather sayings, like you may have heard it's raining cats and dogs. Where did that actually come from? But next, Joe is back to talk more about training and the elements and some of the biggest mistakes people make when getting ready for a special event. We'll also answer more of your viewer questions, so stick around. Back to AccuWeather's Ask the Experts. I'm your host, Jeff Cornish, and today we are talking with AccuWeather long-range meteorologist, the crystal ball, and marathon runner, Joe Lundberg. And uh, Joe's back to talk uh, more about your experience in endurance sports and the mm -hmm. weather's impact on that uh, for athletes uh, and the weather. The weather impacts every aspect of our lives, as we well know. Yes, it does. Uh, well, we wanted to talk about some of the biggest mistakes people make when training, not only for big-scale endurance events, but also uh, maybe for the everyday uh, route of golf in some cases. So what mistakes do you see people make that uh, make, get them into trouble? Some of the simple ones are overtraining, doing too much, too much volume, uh, and you, know, you get to the race day and you just don't have enough left. You know, you, you've just overtrained and your, your body's just like saying, no, we're revolting, we've done too much. Or perhaps you might undertrain. You might not do enough. I know some people who have trained for an event uh, but didn't train enough. I've been guilty of it. I've not trained enough in terms of running for a half marathon or a marathon. And, on, and then I have to say, all right, I need to be smart about this. Is it worth continuing, you know, at the risk of potential injury? Not, not, you know, another, some other mistakes, not hydrating well enough, not staying on top of your electrolytes, not giving yourself enough nutrition. Those are all common mistakes that people make. And I know that because I've made them along the way. I can relate to some of this, Joe. We did a 10-mile, uh, it was called the Barber Beast on the Bay uh, obstacle course in Erie, PA. Did it a few years. It was great. However, the station that I worked with, local TV, we teamed up with uh, an, uh, uh, one of those uh, CrossFit gyms, and they integrated us into a class. It was like getting on the highway with no on-ramp. Uh, I threw up several of the oh, days that I was training. Yeah, this is bad for TV. Uh, but one time I did it right in the middle of the gym. The guy who didn't even know me who worked there asked me to call him when I got home to make sure I made it home. <laughs> but we overtrained. I was fine with the event. But we were doing uh, for training was very different from the actual event that we were training for. Um, but maybe I'm just not cut out for CrossFit. Yeah, I mean, if you've done nothing, like if you've not run, and then all of a sudden you've got a marathon that's coming up in six months, you know, you don't want to go out and your first run is going to be eight miles. That's probably not the best way to do things. Start slow and slowly build. All right. Well, that's good advice. And earlier we talked about you competing in the State College Ironman competition. What are some of your greatest personal athletic achievements here? Uh, and uh, does your knowledge of the weather sometimes help you in these events? It does. And, uh, I've done two full Ironmans, something that I never would have thought I've done, uh, would have done. Um, they were both in Canada, in, in uh, British Columbia, beautiful country there, by the way. Uh, one of the pictures uh, is from me finishing the, uh, crossing the finish line at like 15 hours and 16 minutes into the event. You have 17 hours to complete it. Um, I've run probably eight or nine marathons and have been able to complete them all. There have been some that I've walked a lot at the end, but I've completed those. Um, this event that no longer is being held called the 24-Hour Challenge. We used to do that in Middle Little, Michigan uh, every year during Father's Day weekend. You would uh, you know, ride a prescribed course for as long as you wanted to, 24 hours, and see how many miles you could get. I was able to do 377 in a 24-hour period. That's very impressive. That's a lot. That's it's a, a lot. It's, it's crazy. Going from, but the Delaware River uh, deep into Ohio there, not bad. Um, uh, as we take a look at uh, the difference between sprinting and some short uh, short duration, high intensity of uh, uh, athletic events mm -hmm. and a marathon. Is there a big difference? If somebody's strong with one, will they be also translated to, to good and strong in the other or not always? I'm probably not the best person to ask that question, but I would say that it doesn't always translate. I mean, I know some elite athletes who are way faster than me, uh, but they struggle on some of the more endurance, longer duration events. 
Uh, but then there are some that, you know, they make the transition very well. I've helped to train a couple of them over the past couple of years and just watch them blossom. And then it was like saying, wait for me, wait for me. <laughs> That's really cool. I've uh, done a little bit of uh, just on the side when I worked in Erie, uh, some forecasting work with somebody who has swam across, he swam across Lake Erie. And now <laughs> uh, he uh, trains other elite athletes to do mm. the same. And it's just an amazing thing. That is. The people could do that kind of thing. Yep. Uh, well, we do have another viewer question. This okay. one actually is coming uh, from Tony in New Jersey. So, Tony, what would you like to ask the experts? Here's a question for you. When you're competing in these types of events, what's the biggest challenge for you? Is it like yourself, like your internal thoughts, the other competitors, Ooh. or other things that are out of your control, like the course construction or weather conditions? That's a great question. I would have to go with this very first response, yourself. You know, sometimes the mind will play tricks, and I've had to learn to kind of control that. You know, in fact, when I ran my or did my first Ironman, I was struggling. I cramped up on the bike, and I'm just struggling along on the run, walking, running, walking, running. And I wanted to turn on my chip, and I had to tell myself, no, just keep going. You've got the time to finish. And that, I think, is probably the biggest thing. I don't worry about the other competitors so much in that because I'm not – an elite athlete where I'm looking at getting on the podium for finishes or anything like that. I just want to finish these events. So it's the mind. I think if you have a strong mind, you'll be able to overcome a lot of those challenges. That's great. Do you feel like you are battling the elements and maybe your personal best in the past, uh, kind of competing against yes. yourself and the elements more than any other athletes yeah. out there? And as I get older, you know, I realize that my best is probably not going to be as good as what it once was. I mean, that's just, you know, Father Time never loses. You know, he, he, he's won <laughs> all the time. Just ask Tom Brady that question, you know. <laughs> right. um, so I, I have to recognize, okay, what is the element like today? You know, is it going to be very humid? If it's going to be a warm, humid day and you're running a marathon, you should expect slower times because it's going to drain more out of you. You know, so those are the types of things you've got to factor in. Is there going to be a lot of wind on the course that you're riding or running? That could also have an impact on things as well. Okay, and uh, a very quick question here, just maybe in 15, 20 seconds. Tyler in Ohio writes, is there an event that you'd like to conquer in the future, maybe an ultra marathon? Uh, not an ultra marathon, but I would love to ride across the country one day. That's, that's still one of my personal goals. I want to do that one day. That's great. That's great. Have you guys follow me? Uh, that would be great. I think that'd be a great show. Wouldn't it? Uh, I think you and I have a mutual friend, Jared Seckler, who did that uh, years ago. I'm not sure, uh, but uh, that'd but be that, an amazing event. I would love to do that. Let's make this happen. Uh, I think that'd be great coverage here yes. on the AccuWeather Network. Uh, well, Joe, believe it or not, we have run out of time. How did that go by so fast? Uh, it uh, just flies by. We love talking to you. Uh, we want to thank uh, Joe Lumberg, expert senior meteorologist, long-range guru, and also uh, elite athlete, at least in our mind. Joe, thanks again. You're welcome, Jeff. We appreciate it. And uh, coming up next, uh, ever wonder where some of those weird weather settings come from? We use it a lot. we got answers in our WeatherWise segment right after the break. Back to AccuWeather's Ask the Experts. It is time now for WeatherWise, and today we look at weird weather phrases. And one that's a common term is it's raining cats and dogs. Of course, it usually means that it's raining hard. But where did that phrase come from? Here's a visual, not actual footage, thankfully. So the phrase dates back to the 17th or 18th century in England. Back then, heavy rain would send the water rushing down the streets, taking stray cats and dogs along for the ride in need of rescue. In fact, this artwork from 1820 captures some of this far-fetched idea of torrential downpours of cats and dogs raining down. More than 200 years ago, they've been saying the same thing for a long time. Our next weird weather phrase, the tip of the iceberg. It turns out the Titanic is the source here. In April of 1912, the captain of the luxury ocean liner could only see ahead uh, a small part of the iceberg above the waterline. Uh, and he misjudged the larger ice mass hidden below the surface. As, doc, as Dr. Joel Myers has told us, there was also some refraction, other things at play here visually, too. So this caused a deadly tragedy, sinking the ship and killing more than 1,500 passengers and crew. So now it's a metaphor and a warning. Beware of what you can't see. What is visible ahead could just be the tip of the iceberg. Thanks so much for joining us here on AccuWeather's Ask the Experts. I'm Jeff Cornish. And don't forget, when you have a question about weather, space, or science, you can always write us or send us a video question at asktheexperts at accuweather.com. You can also call us at 888-566-6606. Thanks so much for being with us. Have a great one.